before we get started here, I <clears throat> do have a favor to ask. Um, I know most of you know that, you know, Tom gave me my licensing certificate thing last week. And um, so a lot of you probably think that my classes are over. Um, they're not. Uh, I still have a ways to go. I don't know how to really explain it, but um, it's like I got an associate's degree, but still need to get a bachelor's degree or, you know what I mean? You get, you get something, but you're still not finished. Um, so anyway, the thing that I have to ask of you this morning is, um, Tom has shared with you before, there's basically two styles of preaching. Um, there's expository preaching and there's topical preaching. Um, in the first, you go through uh, the scriptures uh, passage by passage, verse by verse, and you um, preach and explain as you know it to be what uh, God's saying there. In the second, you basically just pick a topic and build a message around it. Um, Tom typically does the first, and he does it very, very well. Um, I always do the second, because um, it's a lot easier. So um, today, Tom's given me my verse to do, and I'm following up with his message from last week. So it's like my really first time of just not picking a topic and doing whatever, you know, kind of thing. So um, I believe it's some kind of a test he's giving me. I don't know it yet. And um, if it's like happens to not be going well, uh, I'm going to need one of you to like fake an injury or something. <laughs> All right. Let's fall on the floor, roll around. We'll, you know, we'll get a nice time out or we'll just, you know, close service, you know. I'll take you to the hospital or everyone will think we're going to the hospital. We'll go to the mall or something. So um, I, I just might need that from one of you today. I'll do it for you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> um, well, Tom started uh, a series last week um, called A Greater Love. And... Uh, we, he was teaching and preaching out of 1 John, and that's what we're going to go to today. Um, and we're going to dig right into the Word, if everybody's good with that. We'll get started. And where we're going to go to is we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to go from verses 1 through 14. Tom went through chapter 1 last week. And uh, if you remember, last week was... Uh, all about walking in the light. Um, John talked about uh, if you say you're in the light, but yet there's still darkness in your life, you're a liar. Um, if you say that uh, you're in Christ or you're a believer in Christ, but there's still darkness in your life, you're a liar. Um, th we're going to have a few more of those um, same light and dark analogies in, uh, in this next um, chapter that we're going to read, but um, where we're going to start is uh, right with verse 1. It's 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And if you're having trouble finding it, it's like right at the end of the Bible. <laughs> I think it's right before Revelations. Um, so just turn to the back if you're having any trouble there. <coughs> but here's how it reads. Uh, verse 1 starts out, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We're going to stop there for a second. Um, as John's um, doing this writing, uh, he starts off... Um, chapter 2 here just by bringing us our thoughts right back into focus of uh, what's important and just reminds us of uh, Jesus uh, being the righteous one, Jesus being the one who uh, died for our sins, his being our redeemer. And I think it's kind of cool where he says that uh, he says if anybody does sin, um, I would put in when we sin. Um, he says that Jesus speaks to the Father in our defense. And I think that's kind of cool to think about that, or to think about that analogy of 
Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and as I mess up or foul up, um, he's there speaking in my defense or speaking on my behalf. Um, I, I don't know, uh, I don't have any other way of um, being able to uh, have those mistakes that I make taken, taken care of or, or um, being made okay with the Father unless Jesus is there speaking on my behalf. We're going to move into verse 3. It starts out, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. We're gonna stop there. we're going to talk about obedience. Um, John talks about uh, if you come to know him, if you come to know Jesus, you will obey his commands. In the scripture, um, or throughout scripture, we have lots of stories of people being disobedient and not following God's commands. A couple that come to mind to me is when the Israelites came to the Jordan River and they're getting ready to cross into the promised land and Moses has led them out of Egypt and they send the spies over to take a look at uh, what the people are like on the other side and Moses sends out 12 spies and when they all come back, only two of them come back and say it's okay for them to cross. Only Joshua and Caleb um, believe that God can lead them forward and uh, defeat their enemies on the other side. And uh, the other two, the other 10 did not trust in God. They said that the people on the other side were too big. uh, They were too strong. Their cities were too strong. Their walls were built too tall. And we should stay on this side of the river. So with that, with not trusting God and with their disobedience, spent 40 years wandering in the desert until a whole new generation of people came up and they came right back to the same spot and God said, let's try it again. Another example that comes to mind is Lot's wife. When God was getting ready to uh, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham, Lot was Abraham's nephew. Um, Abraham was going to God and advocating, can will you please spare my nephew Lot and his wife? And God said, okay, so God sent an angel down and the angel talked to Lot and his wife and the angel said, God's gonna destroy this city with fire. Flee now. Take only what you can carry and flee now and don't look back. And after they got a certain distance away, Lot's wife stopped and looked back. Um, She turned into a pillar of salt. And we can take two things from that. Number one, she was disobedient and there was consequences to her being disobedient. Um, Number two, it's kind of an analogy uh, for our lives as we come to know Jesus. We're not to look back at our old lives. You know, she was leaving a very sinful city and I'm I'm sure she was, you know, there were things there, you know, that um, she wasn't sure that she wanted to leave. And I think that's a part of uh, what we go through as we uh, accept Jesus as leader and forgiver in our lives and, and a change begins to take place in us. But sometimes we look back, we look back at the old life and there's some things there that are still tugging or pulling on us. I think that's somehow how we end up in this light and dark situation that Tom was talking about last week. We say we're in the light and we're a follower of Jesus yet there's some dark things still in our lives. You know, we we have a tendency to want to look back at the things that we're leaving behind and still bring them along with us. And the best best analogy I can give for obedience um, is just how we look at things with our own children. You know, we can 
we can draw lots of analogies of um, things between ourselves and God when we look at how we are with our own children. And um, let's say, uh, say Macy comes up to me next week and <laughs> comes to me and says, uh, hey, Dad, uh, you know, I know you don't know this, but I went and got a job and they just paid me today. I made $100 and I want you to have it. And she gives me this $100 and says, it's yours. I want you to go to a football game and have a good time. <laughs> Great, you know, that's awesome. And, you know, I'm going to be really happy with her and, you know, way to go, Macy. But uh, if I find out, you know, an hour later that for the last three days she hasn't been following any of my rules and she's being obedient to everything else that I've asked her to do, if she's being disobedient to everything else that I've asked her to do, this thing that she's done, this really cool thing and getting the job and bringing me the money doesn't cover over the fact that she's broken all the rules. Um, there still will have to be consequences for that and I'll, and I'll still have to punish her for that. Um, I'll keep her money and I'll, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, still, I'll still go to the football game but there's, there's going to be consequences still for her disobedience. Um, 1 Samuel 15, 22, 15, 22 uh, tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. Um, what God desires most from each and every one of us is just that we hear his commands and we obey them. Not that we go outside of that and do some great thing for him to try to earn his love or um, try to earn our salvation. He asks us just to obey his commands. Um, in this scripture, again, it talks about, talks about us being a liar, or in this passage that we just read. It says, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, the truth there can be looked at as um, just literal truth, you know, his speech, his language, the truth is not in him. But I believe he's referring to Jesus. And Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. The truth is not in that man who is a liar. Um, I um, remember as a young man, uh, I was disobedient to everything. I didn't, um, I didn't have any respect for any authority figures in my life. When I was 19, 20 years old, I, um, I thought it was just my world and uh, everyone should um, conform to it. And uh, I didn't think I had to listen to anything that anybody else had to say. <coughs> and this, this went for even when I was at work. Um, at the time, I worked for a large company in Delaware, Ohio. And we did a lot of uh, big like commercial jobs, state jobs, prevailing wage jobs. Um, when I was 19, I made more money than <laughs> I did this past year. So um, I had a lot of money, and I think with that also comes the fact that you think that you don't have to listen to any, but what anybody else has to say. But one of my jobs, I was working on this job, we were down at the Morse Road water treatment plant, and we was working on this job where uh, we had probably 13, 14 people working there on, from our company. And every day, and I was like the young guy, so like every day at like 11 o'clock, I would have to start going around and getting lunch orders from people and write down what everybody wanted for lunch and collect up their money. And then I would get in my boss's truck and I would drive and I would have to make three or four stops because somebody wanted something from Wendy, somebody wanted something from McDonald's. And I hated it. I just hated doing it. And then I would have to bring back everybody's lunch and give everybody their change. Now, I, yeah, I don't, like today, I would do that, you know, I mean, I was making really good money, you know, I was making over $20 an hour. I would do that all day long for all of you guys if I'm getting paid $20 an hour today. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't look at things that way before, you know, I looked at it as a degrading thing, like I'm the lunch guy, you know, and I hated doing it. And uh, my boss at the time, I'll tell you his name, maybe some of you might even know him, his, his name was Norbert Hawkins. And uh, he went by Norby. But um, he's a really good man, uh, really was. He was a good mentor to me, um, a good teacher. Um, made sure work got done, 
but he was always uh, teaching you something, either about the job or about life. And uh, he told me that I, he always wanted me to roll up the windows and lock the doors of his truck when I went after lunch each day. <coughs> Never did it. And the um, reason was when I'd come out of McDonald's and I was carrying some bags of stuff, I didn't want to fool around in my pockets and try to get the keys out. I didn't want to have to set the stuff down. I left the windows down <laughs> and the, the truck unlocked. Um, one Friday, I come back with everybody's lunch, and after we eat lunch, uh, Norby says to me, hey, Brent, go over to my truck. Uh, get in the front and get in the glove box and uh, get everybody's check out because he always paid us at lunchtime on Friday with everybody's checks. So I go there, and uh, there's nothing there. I said, hey, Norby, they're not in there. He said, uh, check over my visor. Maybe that's where I put them. So I checked and said, hey, they're not there. He said, look under my seat. Is my little briefcase in there? Look in there. And I looked, I said, I, I said they're not anywhere in here. And suddenly I started thinking that, you know, he thinks these checks are in here. And I went after lunch and I don't ever lock the door. I don't ever even roll the windows up. And I started like, panicking in my little heart that these checks got stolen. And it would have been a lot of money. It would have been several thousands of dollars. And uh, he said, hey, go over and look in Homer's truck. Another guy I worked with. He said, look in Homer's truck and look in the glove box. And I look and there they are. So I'm like all happy. And I said, oh, hey, here they are, Norby. And he says, okay, pass everybody's checks out. Pass everybody's checks out. He says, okay, uh, everybody go back to work. So everybody gets up and starts to go back to work. He says, except you, Brent. He says, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, okay. So everybody goes back to work, so I'm thinking I'm going to get like a pay raise because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worthy of that, right? <laughs> and uh, he looks at me and he says, when you go after lunch and when you went after lunch today, you roll up the windows in my truck and lock it like I told you to. And I looked him right in the eye and I said, sure I do. And he said, well, he said, today, he said, I let you get about a block away. I got in Homer's truck, followed you to your first stop. And after you went in, I pulled in, <clears throat> I went up, I got these checks out of the glove box in my truck. I put them in Homer's truck and I came back. He said, you never even knew it. He told me two things. So I thought the next thing was I'm gonna be fired. And uh, he told me two things. He said, first, he said, when I tell you to do something, I need you to do it. You might not know why I need you to do it. You might not know what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm in charge here. I know more than you know. And I need you to do, I need to be able to trust that you're gonna do what I ask you to do. And I said, okay, I will. And he looked me in the eye and he said, and don't ever lie to me again. And I said, okay. And he said, go back to work. And uh, I remember that to this day. Um, I remember that lesson that I learned to this day. And it is so true with how things are with God. We don't know God's ways. His ways are way higher than our ways. We don't know um, what his plans are in, in anyone's lives, how he's working in people's lives. He's given us his commands um, of, of things that he wants us to obey. And he expects us to. He wants us to. Um, and, and I think that's just how it is. Same as it was with my boss at work. I needed to, uh, I needed to do what he uh, had asked me to do. And I, I think back about that time when uh, he looked me right in the eye and told me not to lie to him again. There's very few times in our lives that that's ever going to happen where you're with someone and um, you're, you're, you've told a lie and both of you know 100% that you've told a lie. You know, mo most lies in the world are sprinkled somehow with the truth and everyone has gray areas and everyone, you know, justifies whatever it is they say or do, you know. Um, this was a time where there was like no gray areas. <laughs> you know, it was very obvious to both of us. I had looked him right in the eye and lied to him. And, and here's... Here's just a little sidebar to this, this whole message. I think that's how it is with God, with whatever we do, whether we're lying to ourselves 
we're hiding some sin in our life and we're lying to ourselves that it doesn't exist and, you know, we're living in the light, you know, or whether it's some little white lie we tell to someone else. God sees it exactly the way my boss, Norby, looked at me and saw that when I was 19. He knows our hearts and he knows everything else going around. So whatever degree of what you might be or might not be telling the truth or whether you're um, in the light or you're hiding some sin in your life, God sees it all for exactly what it is. Um, the, scripture, the scripture verse that we just finished says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. We're to be a reflection of him, not reflecting back on him, something negative. We're to be a reflection of him. Verse 7 starts off, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. John takes us back to the light and dark uh, analogies here again of our lives. Um, and it's so true as we think about the darkness and how easy it is to get lost in the dark. You can't find your way. You're going to stumble and fall. You can't see where you're going. Um, sinful things are done in the darkness. The thief comes in the night so he can hide by the cover of darkness. Um, we try to keep the sin in our lives in the dark. We don't want the light being shown on any sinful things that we do. We don't want anyone else knowing about it. We don't even want to look at it. Um, when, we, um, when we're living in darkness, when we're living with darkness in our lives, sin in our lives, we can't really see even how our lives are affecting other people's lives. Let's say you have a, uh, an addiction. Let's say you have a, uh, a drug addiction and you're living in that. That addiction um, will have you living with tunnel vision, all that's important or all that you're thinking of in your life is feeding that addiction or when am I getting high again kind of thing. Um, as you're living in that, you're living in the darkness from a standpoint of you can't even see um, what you're doing to yourself in your own life or how you're affecting the lives of everybody else around you because you are. But you can't see it. Um, and I know a little something about that. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, um, it talks about, uh, it's the first time where um, God gave Moses a command um, for the Israelite people to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And um, I think that's what John's referring to here is he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing you a new command. Um, the love that we receive from God, the love that God has for us, and how God wants us to love him in return um, has been a command that the Israelites had with them from the beginning. It's a command that we have had in our lives from the, from the beginning. I'm going to move on here into uh, verse 12. It says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven 
on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. That's where we're going to stop today. Um, In these verses, John starts off by saying, I write to you, dear children. Then he says, I write to you, young men. I write to you, dear fathers. <clears throat> Obviously, that gives us some um, visuals of uh, a person maturing in life. There's a child and a young man and a father. You know, there's Macy, there's Grant, and then there's me or probably someone else in between. And then me, older, he didn't get to that. But... I, I think he's using that as um, just an ang- analogy of our spiritual lives, um, our spiritual maturity, and our spiritual growth. When we come to Christ, we're little children. You know, as we as we begin a relationship with Jesus, we come to Him just as little children. But as we go along in our faith, there should be spiritual growth there should be some spiritual maturity that happens. There should be some changes that take place along this journey. Um, we should uh, have spiritual growth and spiritual maturity, and it, it'll come from trusting and experiencing God. The more you trust in God, the more you lean into him, the more you experience him, the more mature you should become spiritually. Um, we have a lot of a lot of ways of growing in our spiritual faith. Um, just getting into the Word, spending time in your Bible, spending time more time in your prayer life, being right here on Sunday morning, having lunch with Pastor Tom, joining a home group. And these are all ways that we can grow. In our faith, and we can have, um, we can grow in spiritual maturity, and as we do so, a change should take place. And I think that's, I think that's the bottom line of <coughs> where everything that we've looked at today is leading to. I think that's what John, where John is leading with all of this, um, the light and the dark, saying you live in the light, but still have darkness in your life, um, obeying God, you know, being. Um, having Jesus in your life and, and being obedient to his commands. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, growing and changing. I, I, I think where this is all leading to, I think what it, what it all is basically is um, the fact that there should be a transformation take place. If you come to Jesus and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, if you make that commitment and you've made it not just with your head but with your heart and you've truly made that commitment you're to be born again Jesus said you must be born again you're to become a new person the old is to be put down bringing the darkness along with you there's there's basically at any time anyone ever has or ever will encounter Jesus there's, there's two ways, there's two things that can happen. <clears throat> They'll either reject him and move on with the life that they're still living and miss out on everything that God has for them both in this life and in the next. Or they will accept him and there'll be a life change as Jesus sends his Holy Spirit, as Jesus comes to live in them. There'll be a life change. There's not a third, there's not a third response so many people in the church today, in the world today, in the Christian community, they believe there's a third response. I'm going to accept them, but not fully. There's these certain things I want to still keep in my life. 
there's certain things I want to still have control over. But I'm going to go to church on Sunday and I'm going to tell everyone that I'm a Christian who I meet during the week. But I'm not going to fully submit. I'm going to keep control of certain areas of my life and I'm going to keep these certain sinful things in my life because it's okay and I'm not hurting anybody and nobody else knows about it. I'll keep them in the dark. Nobody else is going to know in the church or ever know. And that's not how it works. That's not an option. If that's the Christian that you're trying to be, God looks at that the same as being the person who rejected him. Um, there's uh, lots of um, examples in, in our Bible of those that rejected him and those that accepted him. Um, obviously, Judas rejected him, spent three years with him, but still betrayed him and never fully accepted Jesus for who he was. Um, there's a story that Jesus tells of the rich, or in, in our scripture that tells of um, the rich young king, rich young ruler who comes to see Jesus and asks him, um, how do I in inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him to obey all the commands passed down from Moses. And the guy says, great, I've always done that. And Jesus says, that's great. Go and sell all that you have now and give it to the poor. Come back and follow me. And he couldn't do that. And he walked away. And he missed out on everything that Jesus had for him. Jesus had so much more for him than his money and his possessions. And he walked away from it. Um, I think there's three main reasons why we have these struggles with the light and the dark and not fully committed. <coughs> um, I think the first is just surrendering. I just think people struggle with that. And I, and I understand. I get that. I had a lot of prideful issues as a younger man. And I know that, uh, I know that people struggle with that. And, and surrendering and giving up ownership of this life, people struggle with that. That's the first reason that they don't fully commit, I, I believe anyway. These are just my thoughts. The um, second one is I think that people at times when they accept Jesus as leader and forgiver in their life and they start to attend a church, they, they think the church is going to cause the change to happen for them. Do you know what I mean? They don't think they have to actually put any effort on their end into having transformation take place in their life. They think they think, oh, I, have, I just show up for church. I'll go to Bible study. And the church and the people around me will lead me and cause the changes to all take place and I'll become a wonderful Christian. Um, the third is I think people sometimes think they need to earn this thing. And they think that I'll become a Christian and what I'll do is I'll dive into a whole bunch of uh, good works that I'll do and through that um, a change will take place in my life. Uh, God will be really happy with me. I'll, um, I'll have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven through that and and we can't earn that. I um, just want to make one statement here. If you hear nothing else that I've said all day, I want you to think about this and ponder this all week. The greatest thing that God will ever do for you in your life, he's already done. You hear what I'm saying? We go before God every day asking for this, asking for that, wanting this, wanting that. Take care of this, take care of that. Bring me victory over this, victory over that. The greatest thing he is ever going to do for you in your entire life, he's already done. When he sent his son, 
the greatest thing he will ever do for you. When I came to accept uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior in my life, um, I had to go through a, a change. I had to go through a rather drastic change. And I know it's not easy. It's like when you're sick. It's like when I had my appendix rupture. You know, the doctor had to take me in. I had to go, you know, I had to have an operation. They had to cut me open. You know, I got a 12-inch scar here because my insides were filled with poison. You know, my appendix had ruptured and I just, you know, continued to ignore it as long as I could until I was finally <laughs> taken to the hospital for emergency surgery. But um, the first thing they had to do was they had to clean the poison out. And that's how it is a lot of times in our lives. We have this sin in our life and it's like a poison. And a lot of times for God to change us, a lot of times for God to be able to heal us from something, we have to be cut open. You know, a wound has to be opened back up and the poison has to be taken out before it can heal. So it's not easy. I know it's not easy and I, I know people, people, people don't want to go through that. They want the love of Jesus and they want to be able to call themselves a Christian, but they don't want to submit to this process that God has through the Holy Spirit of changing them. As I came to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior in my life, I, um, I was pretty much a wreck. <coughs> um, I had issues with alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling, prideful issues, issues with money, material possessions. Um, had issues with anger, hatred, you, you name it. I, I had issues with it. I had a backpack that weighed 100 pounds that was just full of guilt, guilt and shame. Anyone and everyone I ever loved, I hurt. And uh, anyone and everyone who ever loved me, I had hurt and I had let down. <clears throat> and it wasn't easy looking at some of those things in my life. But I'll just say this. Um, Jesus can bring victory over any and all of that. Um, Twelve years clean and sober. And, uh, that wasn't from my power. I had no power over my sin. That only comes from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're struggling with. But I can tell you this. Whatever it is, God's love can bring you a victory over it. Amen? There's no place that his love can't reach. There's nothing you've done that he won't forgive you for. You just have to want it. You have to want it. <clears throat> I'm going to let Mike come on back up here and I'm going to take us into some prayer time. So we kind of um, close this message today. If you're, um, 
<clears throat> if you're here today and you believe that Jesus can meet you where you're at and take care of whatever you're going through, if you believe that he can, but you're doubting that he will, you just have to lean in a little more. You just have to turn up your faith a little more. Because he will. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you with very humble hearts. Amazed by the great love that you have for us. Amazed by a love that you give us that we do not deserve. <laughs> Amazed by your grace and your mercy. So amazed by the gift that you gave us of your son. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. You loved us so much that you went to the cross. Thank you for the victory that you won at the cross. Your love was victorious at Calvary. Thank you for the victory over our sin, over Satan, hell, and the grave. Pray that your Holy Spirit would just be moving through this place right now. You would just be meeting everyone here today, right where they're at, with whatever it is they're going through in their life, whatever struggles they're going through. And I just pray that everyone is feeling you near them right now. And I just pray that everyone is leaning into you right now. where there are addictions I pray that you're bringing strength to break those chains through your love where there's hurt I pray that you're bringing healing where there's depression anger, loneliness. I pray you're bringing hope and joy right now. Pray you're bringing restoration to relationships. I pray that if there's anyone here who's been trying to walk in the light, but still has darkness in their life. either because they fail to want to get rid of it or 
if they have no control over it. I pray you're bringing freedom. Pray that you would make us a a people and a body of Christ that put you first in all things in our lives. That you would make us a people who would be obedient to your commands. A people that would have our hearts open for the Holy Spirit to work within our lives to bring about change and transformation. We would trust in you for that change and that transformation. Knowing that it's just going to bring good things. want to give everyone here an opportunity just to lift these things up to God yourselves. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever this message has been speaking to you today, I want you to speak to God right now yourselves. If there's anybody here today, as we continue to, as we just continue to, to pray over these things, let's just keep heads bowed. If there's anyone here today who has not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, if, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, today needs to be the day of your salvation. There's no waiting for tomorrow. There's no need to wait for tomorrow. Jesus never called anyone and said, I want you to follow me. Go home and think about it. Come back and let me know tomorrow. He said, follow me. I know he's saying that to someone right now. I'm going to pray over that. If you want him to be your Savior right now, you can pray along with me. Pray this prayer. Maybe you've accepted him as Savior before and you've just, the world's been getting you down, holding you back. Maybe you just want to reaffirm that commitment. Just pray that right now. Lord, I come before you. Acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the first and the last. 
Alpha and the Omega. Thank you so much for the amazing sacrifice you made on the cross for me and for all men. And I come before you a sinner and I ask that you just for, please forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I pray that you would move into the center of any and all things of my life. I give up ownership of this life and I hand it to you. Pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and just fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide me in all things. Lead me forward as one of your children. love you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.